speech. But I'm really excited to be here. The, the speakers I've seen so far is super interesting. And uh, yeah, I'm honored to, to be able to present with these guys. So I work at Conservation International. I'm a, a GIS associate, um, analyst here uh, based out of CI Arlington. Um, and we've been using drones since about 2012. Uh, so we're relatively new to the space, but we have a couple of uh, really exciting and interesting drone programs that we're working on around the world. So let me take a step back and introduce uh, Conservation International first more generally, so we can uh, kind of put the right lens on, on how we're using drones uh, around the world. So super quick, uh, Conservation International was founded in 1987, so we're just over 30 years old. Uh, we have about 900 employees, about 300 to 350 of them are in the U.S. Um, and upwards of 90% of our employees are actually citizens of the countries that we work in. So we have, uh, we work in 25 countries around the world with uh, over 30 field offices. So uh, when we work with programs in a specific country, uh, we're also working with the people that are from there. They might be with, within our organization, but um, they're also from the place. And uh, we also have plenty of of partner organizations that are, are that are local as well. So that's something that we really stress. Um, so Conservation International um, is focused around environmental conservation, but we recognize that the environmental piece is inseparable from the human aspect. So the people that live in the area that are dependent on the nature um, are really our prime, one of the, if not the primary focus of our work. Um, and you'll see that come through in our drone programs as well. Um, so we have an annual budget of around $160 million, um, and we have four major centers, one of them being our, our science department, which has become uh, quite influential in, in the drone sphere over the years, or, I'm sorry, the conservation world over the years. Oops, I gotta shrink this. There. So um, why we use drones? Uh, environmental conservation um, really struggles with finding funding for the work that we're trying to do. Uh, still today, the, the existential threat of losing our, of our nature and um, the threat that climate change poses to our civilization really hasn't come through in terms of financing. So um, as a result, we, we are limited in terms of how much we can actually spend on, on the equipment that we use or, um, or the data that we, we want to use for things like monitoring and evaluation. So high resolution satellite imagery, although can be really, really important uh, and helpful for our work, is almost always not feasible for the projects that we're looking at. So that's where drones can really come in and, and fill this really important data gap uh, and, and uh, give us like a, a low cost option for collecting data that we need in order to make real-time important decisions uh, for forest conservation. And I'll give you some examples of, of what that looks like. Um, we also, uh, drones are also really, really helpful and consumer drones now that they've become so, so light um, and portable is extremely important for us because a lot of the, the nature that we're trying to conserve in the areas that we work um, are very remote. Um, so there, there can be in places that take uh, hours, if not days, just to hike to the areas where, um, where the protected area begins or where um, deforestation or some kind of um, monitoring activity needs to take place. Um, it's also uh, the fact that they are customizable in terms of how we use them. Uh, again, that's something I'll get into. So for forest monitoring, for land use planning, for wildlife monitoring, um, for communication purposes, uh, those are really, really appealing aspects of drones uh, for, for our work. So how does CI use drones? Um, we have projects all over the world. So we have them um, in, uh, we have a mangrove restoration project in the Philippines where we use drones to uh, take pictures of a restoration site along the coast. Uh, sometimes those areas are really difficult to, to survey in person. Uh, they can take days or weeks just to walk around and make sure that things are, are progressing that, in the way that they need to be. While with a drone, one person can stand on the coast and, and take, uh, 
pictures all along the coast for, for several miles in each direction um, with higher, higher accuracy for the, for the work. Another project is in New Caledonia where they use it for um, the tracking of the cowrie population, which is a specific type of tree that's really important for the ecosystem out there and the watershed management. Uh, the cowrie are, are giant trees uh, with really unique branch structures. So uh, we're able to use the drones to take pictures of the forest canopy and, um, uh, and, and visually and manually identify where the cowrie trees are and even um, how well they're growing, kind of the, the quality of the, of the canopy structure. Um, we've done some capacity building work with the local universities in, in Timor-Leste, where we mapped some of the, the watersheds and, and uh, did some environmental education program out there to um, teach people the importance of watershed management for, for their drinking quality and for the general ecosystem in the area. Uh, we work in Cambodia as well. And then <clears throat> two of the programs that I'm going to uh, share a little bit more information about and um, that have a little bit more pictures in the slides that will be more interesting uh, are in Madagascar and Peru. So I'll skip over those right now. And um, we also have a program in Colombia. So um, yeah, our, our work is really stretched out across the world. Um, all of these projects happened um, post 2012. Uh, so we're, we're relatively new to, to the space. Um, and uh, one thing that I was uh, that I'll get into in the end is kind of CI's uh, intentions as an organization for how we want to um, uh, kind of, we, okay, so to spill the beans a little bit, uh, we're planning to uh, create a, a drone center at CI so that all these disjointed projects um, can, can have a way of, of sharing their insights and, and for us to better position ourselves for outside collaboration and, um, and for, um, uh, knowledge sharing internally as well. And two more exciting projects that are coming up um, are, are both in the uh, in the coastal realm. So a lot of these projects that we have right now are, are based on land, um, but two projects that we're looking into are, are one is um, a bay in Hawaii, <coughs> excuse me, um, where they want to look at nighttime spearfishing, which is uh, a big data gap for the management of the coastal areas in Hawaii. Uh, and another one is in coastal surveillance uh, in, in Costa Rica. So that would be uh, a larger scale project where they want to identify uh, larger uh, illegal fishing operations off the coast. So the first project uh, I would like to talk about in more detail is the one in, in Peru. Uh, we work in the Altamira landscape, which is in uh, northeastern Peru. Uh, it's right at, on the other side of the Andes where the mountains and the Amazon meet. So it's this really unique landscape of, um, of Amazon rainforest in highlands and, and lowlands. So the combination uh, creates a really interesting ecosystem with, with really um, high biodiversity uh, and is, is critically important for the watershed in the region, but is also important for um, global carbon sequestration. So we've been working there since 2012. Um, our team works um, with a Phantom DJI Pro and one DJI Mavic. Um, and the primary uses are for land use planning and forest surveillance. The most interesting part about this project, however, is that we've been uh, doing most of our mapping over indigenous communities. So we've been, uh, so far we've mapped um, 18,000 hectares um, covering three of the 12 indigenous communities. One of the communities has been mapped um, for us and not the 85% of their land area has been completely mapped. Um, and, um, and through this process, um, of course, in order to, to reach that point where we were able to, to take image, uh, uh, images of their land, there was a long engagement process um, and we had been working with them um, among, on other projects um, for land use planning and whatnot. But as, <coughs> as we continued this project and, and developed uh, the maps for them, they, they really saw the value and became very interested in uh, being able to 
run this kind of analysis or, or create collect this kind of data on their own. So now in, in Peru, we actually train um, and, and work very, very closely with some of these indigenous communities to fly drones so that they can do uh, land use planning of, of their own lands. Additionally, we work with um, the, the park rangers. Um, a lot of times in, in this area, we, we can be aware of um, deforestation events happening or, or we've been tipped off of uh, certain areas where deforestation is suspected to have happened, but it can be very difficult for us to, to get there or for the park rangers to get there um, in time, uh, either to catch them, catch the, the loggers uh, in action, or, or it's actually just too far um, and too dangerous of a region to, to spend the time to walk out there. So drones offer this really um, incredibly powerful capability for the park rangers to go out and do surveillance, um, take pictures of areas of deforestation, use those pictures to contact the, um, the uh, local police, and the police can often come in at that point and, and do the interventions and uh, write the citations and whatnot. So it's been a very powerful tool for empowering the local park rangers as well. And that, that's trainings at CI uh, and uh, the local park rangers, uh, or CI conducts the, the trainings for those park rangers. Uh, the next project is in Madagascar. Here, uh, we, Madagascar has seen really, really devastating deforestation uh, over the last 20 years. Um, and, and those rates are accelerating really fast. And a big problem uh, that we have as conservationists trying to mitigate that is the lack of, of data um, and monitoring capabilities. So drones are really um, an interesting prospect for us to uh, empower our conservationists conservationists on the ground and our partners in the local communities uh, within the Ministry of, of Environment and, um, <coughs> excuse me, yeah. So we work in the CAS and the COFAB landscape, which are in the Northeast and Southeast. Um, they are two huge landscapes um, with protected areas and with uh, buffer zones around those protected areas that are being just devastated by, uh, by deforestation, largely from um, uh, subsistence farmers and uh, community members. We uh, went out there in May and we conducted a, a training. Uh, it took many, many months to actually um, do the planning for the training. For, so for those of you that are a little bit more interested in um, kind of the operation side, um, <clears throat> there were definitely some hoops to jump through in terms of getting permission from the government. So Madagascar, surprisingly, um, has a really stringent uh, drone program already in terms of their regulations. Um, as, as far as I can recall, they, they copied a lot of it from the Australian regulations. So there are a lot of similarities there. And um, there's some, some fun stories to share there if you guys are interested. So I'll keep moving on. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And um, so, Within this landscape, we use them primarily for uh, reforestation monitoring, which is this cool little animation I showed you here on the right. Uh, this is one of our reforestation sites. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like much of a reforestation site, um, in part because, well, because uh, a lot of this area had actually been burned uh, in, in the last uh, one or two years, even though the, the trees have been planted about three or four years ago. So this is one of the examples where um, based on our capacity, really all we could do was go in there, um, talk to the communities, plant the trees, but then in the years that followed, we didn't have the capacity to, to monitor and protect this area. So uh, after, after some time, um, either community members who did not know about it or people from outside, they, they had come in and they had burnt this area to prepare it for agriculture. So now that we have drones, we're hoping that we can, one, measure the progress um, of this specific site um, to see how, uh, how the burned areas have recovered. And also for, for future sites, we're hoping that drones will provide the capacity for us to maybe avoid a situation uh, where, where our reforestation sites are getting burned. 
So um, based on, this is the area that uh, I just showed the animation for. Um, here are four of the products that we created uh, to create our baseline for the area. Uh, we have a, just a regular ortho mosaic. We use the um, DJI, oh no, sorry, I uh, used the Pix4D uh, software in order to create these products, um, which, was, which was quite easy, and easy for us and, and that's important for us because we don't have uh, a large drone team or too much time that we can invest uh, into the post-processing for a lot of these projects. So having a software like Pix4D is, is very important and helpful. Um, and we were able to create a, a digital surface model, digital terrain model, and the vegetation height model. Um, so the vegetation height was just created from the digital surface model, subtracted from the uh, digital terrain model. And then we uh, did a manual classification of the areas that had exhibited uh, or had experienced large burns. So that was these, these dark areas around here. And then uh, using this uh, vegetation height, we were able to identify areas that had kind of uh, survived and recovered quickly. Furthermore, uh, in, in Madagascar, we were able to conduct this, uh, this uh, um, we take these images, collect this data in May during our training, but uh, several months after the training, we still hadn't received our uh, official certification from the government uh, up until September. So, about a week after we received our certification, we were uh, quick to get our drones back in the air. And we um, launched them with this interesting project with the local park rangers. Um, or sorry, not park rangers, but it was actually community members who are in charge of, uh, of conserving the local forests, uh, the regional government, and the regional ministry of environment. Uh, they all went out with a small team of our drone pilots um, and we went out and did a surveillance mission of uh, areas that we thought uh, have been suspicious and, and might have gone under um, deforestation events. So we went out there, um, we flew the drone north and south, east and west, um, using the, the video feed that we were getting from, from the drone, uh, we were able to identify some uh, sites of deforestation and from that, um, actually five people were, were apprehended for illegal deforestation just from one mission. So this is really, um, it has been a really powerful tool for us uh, in, this, in this big fight of, against deforestation in Madagascar. Okay, so those, that's the end of the slides that I have so far. Um, I would just like to take one, one more minute just to quickly talk about um, sort of CI's intentions for how we want to use drones in the future, and and then I'll hand it over to you guys for, for questions, which uh, will be an important part of my presentation. I'll lean on to you guys for, for asking some, some pointed questions so, I can, uh, so we can get into that. So at CI, um, as I mentioned earlier, we are still relatively new to, to the drone world. Uh, we have some really, really talented people here on our team. Um, globally, but um, when it comes down to the operations part, a lot more goes into uh, developing a drone project or program uh, in a new country than just having uh, kind of the drone technology expertise. So we're trying to create um, this organization internally or this center where we can um, uh, aggregate all of the results that we have um, create a, a data portal for our projects internally, and then also um, position ourselves to better um, work with people like in, in, in this webinar, uh, you know, the front runners in, in this field of, of drones and drones and conservation to, to really help us um, up our game and to prepare us for the, the, the huge strides and advances that are coming in, in the drone world uh, in the next coming years. So, To pick up on that, so what, sorry, I, I might have spaced out for a second. So what's your plan for, is it an internal, um, is it, it's a capacity building for drones, right? Yeah. So what so we're trying to do, um, right now, all of these projects are, are quite disjointed. Um, each, each one has its own funding source and 
each one has its own kind of drone enthusiast that, that pushed it through into the project. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what we're trying to do now is find a way to make this process a lot easier. So a lot of drones are, are definitely a buzzword at CI these days. So a lot of people are, are interested in, in including drones into their work, um, but they don't know how. They don't know what it actually means. Yeah. Um, we don't have a lot of resources or, um, I mean, we have examples, but not uh, resources from those examples. So what we're trying to do is, is build up that, um, that organization around what it means to have a global drone uh, organization. Uh, <laughs> So have you, have you looked at um, models like We Robotics, like their flying labs? So they're really cool. It's an operation. Um, anyway, they're called We Robotics. So have a look at them. And their model is to build flying labs in different countries um, around the world that have specific expertise for um, specific applications of drones. So in Nepal, it's around flying drones in high altitude area. In the Pacific, it's around flying them and marine spaces. They were looking into, I think it was in Cambodia doing, um, that they came from a humanitarian space, but they're moving into the conservation space more. And I think in Cambodia, they were looking at um, monitoring seagrass and, and, and marine mammals and, and the like. So, and like in, in the Amazon, they were developing a lab that was around flying drones long distance for medical delivery. Um, yeah. So they're quite interesting in, in that it's about developing local expertise that, um, and then doing cross, doing sabbaticals and information exchange across um, the different labs. So it could be one you could leapfrog on. Um, yeah. But I'm quite interested to hear, so it's, I mean, CI is massive. Do you have plans for it to be a resource that the broader conservation community can benefit from? Yeah, um, I would say that's definitely our our intention is not to have all this all this this knowledge and these all these lessons learned and, and hoard it. Um, we don't gain anything from that, but definitely we would like to. Um, I would say we would just to build our our organizational capacity. Uh, not just for our own projects, but then also to, to share that knowledge and also to be in a position where we can take in all the, the knowledge that's coming in from, from other projects. Yeah. Hey, Thomas, are you on the, Thomas and Nigel at RSPB, you're on the line, aren't you? Yes, you are. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, do you guys have experience for what you guys are, because you've been, so Thomas, the team at RSPB have been working uh, have been f doing a lot of work around developing best, best practices around drones, specifically around GIS work, and we've been right. feeding a lot of that best practice work into Wild Labs and out to the broader community. Yeah. I wonder if you guys could speak to how you've been doing um, the organizational capacity building and like pulling in that, that sort of information. Yeah, good question. So, I mean, we, that, we developed that internal best practice guidance document, which we then kind of shared with Wild Labs very, very organically. You know, we had people all over our reserves, all over the country buying up drones, and they were just using them to essentially like happy snapping. And, uh, and so we, we tried to realize the potential of, of mapping with drones using, uh, yeah, essentially Pix4D and, and, and other software like that. But um, yeah, you know, a, a couple of intranet s stories goes a long way in your organization saying, hey guys, if you're using drones, then then we can help. So I guess it's like a honeypot? Uh, yeah, definitely. Now we're, we've kind of formally established a sort of consultancy service within our GIS team now. So, you know, we say so long as you, uh, so long as you gather images in following our best practice document, i.e. with the, you know, more or less 70% frontal and lateral overlap geotagged images as per the guidance document, then we'll give you a like service level agreement turnaround time of like one to two weeks to get your imagery into our um, sort of uh, corporate GIS system for people to actually look at and start using in their maps. Cool. Thanks, Thomas. So that creates buy-in if you're kind of offering a service, right? Does that sort of align with what what your vision is? Yeah, I mean, oh. I would I would say what what, what most of our uh, 
what most of our colleagues are finding really useful is actually just getting high um, spatial temporal resolution images of their reserves. Yeah. And, uh, okay, I'm not sure if you answered the question around, so it'll be first in building internal capacity, but will that then extend to the conservation community? Because you've got Liam Pinko just joined CI, is that right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So you're going to be tied in with conservation drones. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're going to build a lot from some of the conservation drones, um, the, the model that they've created and some of the tools that they have on their, on their website are things that we're interested in, in recreating and, and utilizing for, for our work. Um, I would say we, to, again, to, to your question, we are really interested in external collaboration uh, and, and also sharing whatever uh, lessons learned that we have. And we already have a bunch uh, just from having to, to develop these, these programs in, in various like political climates and, and geographical climates as well. Um, uh, and, and Liam Pinko is, is definitely uh, going to play a huge role in, in this program moving forward. Um, I would say to um, what, what Thomas just mentioned, that would be an, an incredible tool for us to have, is to have like this like internal GIS consultancy. Um, unfortunately at CI, our GIS capacity for, for drones right now is, is very limited. Um, there are only uh, several less than 10 people who have uh, really had experience with this. And this, that's 10 people uh, disjointed and spread throughout the whole world, you know. Um, so I think that that would be great for us, but more realistic would be to build the capacity within each program uh, that we have, uh, each, each country office rather, um, and to teach them how to teach local communities, how to teach other partners um, to, to fly the drones, but then also to do the processing. So I think ideally in terms of capacity building um, internally, what we're looking for uh, would be to uh, create this framework or, or kind of even like a, um, like a course that our programs could take for them to uh, learn how to fly drones and then also learn how to do the processing on their own. Good.